Well, <clears throat> I was up at the Lakewood Ranch campus this, this week, and there's a lot of things going on. And one of the things that was going on this last weekend is we were starting to get signage up. And um, we're, we're, you know, we're using these really clean letters that, you know, tell you where you're at, you know, restroom or cafe, you know, it's, and it's real easy to know. Believe it or not, one of the most uh, um, cited complaints for people when they come to a brand new church is they don't know where to go. So we're trying to make sure that it's very clean and, and together. And so I was on one side of the hub and I looked down all the way down the hub, it's a pretty large space, and there's a big Christmas tree down at the uh, end of the hub. And uh, <clears throat> I noticed that my wife had um, come in and you know Mindy's not there all the time and it was like man that's my wife and I love my wife so I wanted to go down and say hi to her um and uh um and she was talking with another staff member and I got up and you know hey what's going on and they said so what are we gonna do with that and I, I had to look behind the tree I'm like what and they said the cafe sign and I said what do you mean and they said well the you know the little mark is in the wrong spot you know, and I'm thinking, oh man, they've just put that up with glue, pulling that thing off, and then having to repaint. I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the cafe sign. I did not want to be another one, you know. So uh, I, I looked at it, and I, I was like, yeah, it's definitely wrong, you know, uh, the, where the accent mark is should be at a different place. And then I started thinking, I'm like, well, maybe it's not. I mean, like, surely somebody spell-checked this thing when they put it up and then I thought well I've written papers too and thought I spelled check something and spelled something wrong because I'm from Kentucky can I get an amen anyway and uh, um, uh, which you know that's just it is what it is but uh, um, pray for pray for me anyway but uh, so I thought you know what let me just I typed on my phone how do you spell cafe and everything that came up was matching what was on the wall but of course we all knew that that wasn't right, so I start scrolling to try to find the one that fits my narrative. And, and it didn't take me long to realize, no, I'm wrong, this is spelled right. And so I, I turned to them and said, no, it's, it's spelled right. One of the staff members grabbed my phone and started scrolling because they were going to prove me that I was wrong. And then we finally came to the conclusion that it was right. The accent mark did not need to be over on the far side of the E, it needed to be in the middle of the E. And, and we just, we realize something that, <clears throat> hey, we're wrong. But I, but I say that to say this. So many times in our lives, we think we're right. And we will scroll through whatever and read through whatever to find that we're right so that we can support that we're right, not even maybe thinking that we might be wrong on something. And, and I say that because every single time we come to my Christmas series, this, Everybody always says, man, you just absolutely tear apart the Christmas story and tell me stuff that's crazy. I want that apostrophe to be here rather than in the center. And, and, and I say that just to say that, you know, I'm not trying to mess up anybody's Christmas story. I'm, I get called the nativity scene killer usually around um, Christmas time. And I'm not trying to be that. I'm, I'm just trying to be biblical. So what we're going to do again is we're going to go back to scripture and we're going to realize that a lot of the things that we hold to be true are not really found in the Bible. Um, and that's okay. Um, but well, I think what we're going to find is that the story is much deeper and more profound and more meaningful than we could have ever um, even imagined. So if you're new to Grace and you've never been through one of the Christmas series, just get ready because you're going to be scrolling after church trying to go, that guy is wrong. He is, he's messed up. But I, I, we're going to be very biblical here and I want to try to walk you through the story. But what I want to do this particular um, season, because um, I, I love the, the, the Christmas story, I, and, and I, it, it's one of those things that when I <clears throat> teach classes on hermeneutics, which is how to interpret scripture, I usually use it as like, okay, this is what you think you know, this is what the Bible says, when you realize that the Bible says stuff that you didn't, that, that isn't, you, you thought was right, that you realize isn't right, how many other things are we going to to scripture thinking that we're right that we really need to think through this thing and I would also say that sort of also sort of cascades into all the areas of our lives remember he that thinks he standeth take heed lest he fall can I get an amen on that one I mean we don't want to be arrogant and prideful so what we're going to do this this series <clears throat> brand new series called manger um, I'm going to take uh, a very specific part of the Christmas story and spend several weeks um, in, in this, talking about uh, the, the manger, 
And uh, um, I think that as we talk about this, we're going to be like, whoa, this is really some cool stuff. So here's the big idea um, that, that, that I want to work with in this particular series. Um, and, and I always try to have a big idea. I always try to have something that we can work through together um, sort of as a big umbrella is this. We're going to reflect a little more deeply on the sign that was given to the shepherds. And you may say, okay, what? I'm not really sure what sign was given to the shepherds. It's okay. That's, that's why we come here. We come here. It's why you watch online is to go to the word of God and to say, what does the word of God say? And then, and then hopefully what we do, and we try to every, at the end of every message, is I try to give you some really good practical things to think about um, in your life. But we want to take a little bit more in-depth look at the sign that was given to the shepherds and you might be wondering hey what was that sign well to do that we're going to have to go to Luke 2 12 where the angels are talking with the shepherds and they're telling them about the sign and so let's let's look at this together and let's see if we can sort of pull some things out of this and and work through a chunk of scripture today and see if uh, see if we can really see some things that are pretty cool it says this will be the ESV says a sign um, I very rarely um, try to correct um, a, a translation that I use because then it makes people think, well, you know, is there other things wrong? Now, the ESV is a pretty good translation. Um, I just disagree with the A sign um, because there is a definite article before the Greek word for sign, and, and I think that necessitates a the, um, and sign is singular, it's not plural, so, so it is a, it's not just a sign, it is the sign, and so I, I made this sort of, and some translations do say the sign, which I think is probably a little better. I don't know why they did a here, because normally they're pretty good at this stuff, but this will be the sign for you. So, so, so now we got a sign, and if they got a sign, we want to know what that sign was um, because th that's important for us as people who want to know what the Word of God says. He says, you will find a baby. Now, the baby could be a sign. It's possible. Um, but a baby wouldn't be something that would be abnormal, that they, they would have seen babies before. So probably not. I mean, the baby obviously is Jesus. So, I mean, it's definitely what they're after. But that's not the sign. The, uh, baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. And that, that could be the sign. Um, and definitely would make the shepherds feel very comfortable because that's the way they wrapped their kids. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Jesus comes in the very way that would have made the shepherds feel comfortable. M maybe we ought to think about that a lot of times because, you know, we think as Christians we need to make everybody feel sort of put, put, put off or we need to tell them what the truth is. Isn't it interesting that Jesus usually always comes in a way where he meets people where they are, it, 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 you know, just like the woman at the well. The, now he's got the little baby in swaddling cloths and the shepherds come, they can identify. I think we probably ought to think a little bit about that when we think about evangelism is, you know, Jesus met people where they were. Maybe we ought to get better as a church meeting people where they are. That's an amen, right? You know, so anyway, so I don't think that's the sign um, because it wouldn't be abnormal, but this would be strange. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. That would probably be something that would be strange, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I want to show you that I really think that the sign is the manger because of the way Luke uses this in his, um, in his passage. So in verse 7, says she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. So, so, so here's another use of manger. We also have in Luke 2.16, they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. There, there, there is an emphasis here um, in Luke as you go through the passage in chapter 2 that, that this manger is a really important element of the story. And it, it, the reason it is is because of what is going on here. And what's interesting is I get to um, take people um, to Israel. We've been doing it, you know, for years now. And um, we did in February. We were going to be doing it in February of 2021, but we'll, we'll, we'll be pausing that one, but we will go back in 2022. What's great is when we get to a place called Tel Megiddo. Um, a Tel um, is a place where different civilizations have sort of, you know, come in and it you know, defeated a civilization and then they built their civilization and then somebody else came along and built their civilization. So it's sort of built up, you know, this sort of a mound. Um, and, and we go to Tel Megiddo. Um, in the Hebrew, um, the word for mountain is Har. And, and so you get Har, the mountain of Megiddo, which translates into our um, Bibles as Armageddon. Um, so it's the Har Megiddo, the Tel Megiddo, um, you know, everybody's revelation and all this stuff. And we talk about that there. Um, but, but what's interesting is we go up onto the Tel, we get to show people a manger. 
And typically, when they realize, wow, I mean, it's like you can just see it, like, wow, man, that's not, that's not what I was expecting. So I got a picture here for y'all um, from, from Israel. This is a manger. Probably like you're going, what? That, that, ain't, that ain't what's in my nativity scene. <laughs> it's this piece of wood with some hay. Like, that, that don't look nothing like my nativity scene. Yeah, um, the, the nativity scene, don't tear them down. Everybody always says, I, you know, um, but there weren't three wise men, and they didn't show up when Jesus was a baby. They showed up when he was later. We'll talk about that at another Christmas, but uh, everybody's always like, Chip, you just kill my nativity. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to tell you the Christmas story. So anyway, th- this is interesting because this is a feeding trough. doesn't really sound great to say, away in a feeding trough, does it? Like manger makes it seem a little cleaner, yeah, a little bit more stale. Like, you know, we got this nativity scene. They're all porcelain, you know, and it's like, it, we just like to make this thing. This is, this is ugly. This is dirty. This is where animals fed. It would not be normal to have laid a baby in this. But that's what they had. A place where animals would feed. And there's a lot of things we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, but just think about this. We will feed upon that child as well when we partake of communion. There's so many things about this manger that are significant to you and me in our Christian walk. It's not just by happenstance that Jesus was placed in a manger. What makes this really unique is if you knew the first century and the way things um, went, when a person would die they would be placed in what is called a sarcophagus um, oftentimes. And a sarcophagus is a hybrid Greek word that means flesh eater. And as they were placed in the sarcophagus and the flesh would rot away, then they would come back later and get the bones and they would then put the bones in what's called an ossuary and that's where you would uh, um, you know, find the person um, buried. Well, this looks just like a sarcophagus without a top if you know like the imagery of stuff and so Jesus this this sign there's a sign that they will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a feeding trough here's the situation a baby that's wrapped in cloth and is lying in a stone feeding trough would look as though they were dead but this baby was alive there's, there is huge things going on here that we're being told if we pay attention. And it's obvious that Luke wants us to see these things because Luke, as most New Testament writers do, he, he knows how to write. Um, they usually start off a book with something and they end a book with something. And, and, and sometimes it's multiple layers. I mean, like the book of Romans. If you go to Romans 1-4, it says that, uh, we're, that, that, that to bring the uh, obedience of faith to the nations. If you go to chapter 16 at the end, it's to bring about obedience of faith to the nations. Like, why is that this way? Why are these books written this way? Luke starts off with Zechariah in the temple praying, remember? And he ends with the disciples in the temple praying. There's, there's, they, they know what they're doing. Luke also tells us that Jesus is born to Mary and Joseph. She's a virgin, so it's a virginal baby that is wrapped in swaddling cloths, wrapped in cloths, like Lazarus. When Lazarus was put in a tomb, he was wrapped in in cloths, um, laid him in a manger, this rock-hewn limestone manger. Well, that's that's not insignificant because Jesus is going to tell you, or Luke's going to tell you about Jesus later in his gospel, that as Jesus comes down from the cross, there is another Joseph and Mary there. And these, are, these words are there so that you can remember the story. Different Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene. Not the same Joseph and Mary, but another Joseph and Mary that are receiving Jesus down from the cross. And what do they do? Luke's very specific. They wrap him in cloth. And where do they put him? In a rock-hewn tomb. Listen to what he says. Where no man has ever lain. It's a virginal tomb. Just like he came out of a virgin, he will rise again from a virginal tomb. They were both borrowed. The the trough was borrowed and the tomb was borrowed. There's there's stuff being told to you and me in these stories that are so incredibly rich that if we 
maybe just sort of run through with our typical understanding of Christmas, we might miss some of the great things that are, that are going on. So what I want to do this weekend is I sort of want to get the story going. So I need to sort of recount the story. And then we're going to spend a couple of weeks looking at the manger itself and, and all of the things that we can see about this thing that really speaks to us um, on a deep and profound level, especially during this Advent season and especially during the world that we live in today. So let's, let's look at the story here and go back and try to refresh ourselves and maybe learn some things along the way. It says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Bottom line is this. Um, the, the powers that be would always remind any Jew that was living in first century Palestine that they were not free. They, they were still under oppression. They were under the, the Roman rule. And as Caesar told everybody to go back to their towns and be registered, it would be once again another sign to them and um, in in, 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 in the way that they knew things is that they had not been freed. They were still in exile. And so oftentimes the reason they would do these registrations is because um, it, would, it would send people back, it would break up local groups because everybody would have to go back to their own town. And, and typically they would give them a year. They didn't ask everybody to go back at one moment. You had a year to get back to your place. The bottom line is though is you had to go back to your place of birth and register um, and, and that would squelch any type of rebellion going on because people would then be disseminated amongst the, uh, the, the, the country. But this is, this is what's going on and, and it would be a reminder. And, it, and, and if you were looking at it from just purely a secular deal who's in control Caesar is the politics of of the day so there's a decree that goes out and all the world should be registered and this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of of Syria Um, you may have if you if you love apologetics or you like to argue with people you may find from time to time that somebody goes ah we don't know for sure that this is this is correct there's plenty of good um uh, reasons that to not to not believe that somehow this is incorrect. Luke is a really good historian. Um, it's very possible too that this could actually be saying that this was before the registration that was made by Quirinius um, in Syria. Um, but we also have some extant literature that says that Quirinius may have done two particular um, registrations uh, d- during his time as, as rule. The bottom line is there's no reason not to uh, um, to think that this is is, is accurate. But I, I just want to mention that because there are people that will say, oh, you know, whatever. It's it, they're always going to find problems to disagree with with scripture I'm here to tell you that the Bible is the word of God we have every reason to believe that what we have is is true this was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria and they were told and all went to be registered each to his own town now that is important because you would have to go back to the town from which you were born and so we need to make sure that we understand that in this story and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea. Typically, when you go up, you're going to Jerusalem. That's that's the way the the wording, it's sort of Luke's uh, sort of baiting us here as he went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, and you would think which is called Jerusalem, but that's not what was said. It is which is called Bethlehem. So he's going back to the lowly town that King David was was raised in and, and Matthew which we don't have time to get into but Matthew's genealogy have you ever read that you know most people like read the first chapter of Matthew and they're like let's get to chapter two you know because you, you, you begat 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 you know like I don't, I mean, no it's actually telling you massive amounts of information in that genealogy it's in there for a reason and one of the things he's saying is is from Abraham to David was 14 generations Abraham came out of Babylon Um, out of the Ur of the Chaldees. So from Abraham to David was 14 generations, the great King David. But from David, because David fell and there's no earthly king that can deliver you and me, and the next subsequent 14 generations went from David back to the deportation to Babylon. In other words, they ended up at the same exact place as they started. What they needed was they needed a true king. And that's why from Babylon to the Christ is 14 generations. Matthew's telling you something from a genealogy. And Jesus comes into the lowly city of Bethlehem. He's going to be the true Davidic king. So Joseph, although it looks as if, you know, the, the powers that be are getting him there, God is moving to get him to where he needs to go and Mary as well. So he goes to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Once again, 
when you see these words, you need to pay attention. He's telling you why he went there, because. And this is, this is a big tale. Like, I mean, it's a small little group of words, but you and me, maybe not understanding the ancient Near East and understanding first century culture, might, might miss this. He was of the house and lineage of David. That's, that's huge information for you and me. Why is that huge information for you and me? It's huge information for you and me because it means that when he went back to Bethlehem, he would have had many places to stay. He would not have walked in and not had a place to stay at all in any way, shape, or form. He was of the house and lineage of David. There would have been so many people that would have loved to have him stay in their house. And we've got, we got to continue this here because Luke's telling us all the things that we need to know, just sometimes we just miss it, and it's okay. But we just need to make sure that we understand the, the accent mark's not all the way over here. The accent mark is right here. That's, this, is the, this is the center, and we want to make sure that we get the, the story right. So he's of the house and lineage of David, which means he, he's going to go into town, and there's going to be all kinds of people that want Joseph to stay in. Now, Joseph was the only one that would have had to go to Bethlehem because Mary was from Nazareth. She would not had to have gone had Joseph not wanted so. He could have gone by himself. But what we have is we have Mary who's gone to spend time with Elizabeth, has now come back. She's she's at the place where a trip from Joseph to Bethlehem would take quite a while and there's no really good reason to leave her there because she might have child, which is what Luke says. He says to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with child. This is all important. So he goes with Mary. Why does he take her? Well, they're in the middle of being married. She's still a virgin. A Jew- Jewish wedding is you're, you're married, but it's, but it's not the full consummation. Then, then the, the, the guy who's married you goes and prepares a place, prepares the house, does whatever needs to be done, and then they come back, and that's like the parable of ten virgins where the bridegroom comes back to, to get the bride, and then you'd be taken to the house, and consummation would, would happen. That's why Jesus, like in John 14, when he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, that's all within the understanding of Judaic marriage, where you know, he's, we're married to him, but he's going to prepare a place for us and one day he will come and get us and we will we will we will be with him but she's Mary's going with him because she's with child the 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 idea here is that that she needs to go because she's probably at the latter stages of her pregnancy and I love what one of the New Testament scholars says he says from a secular viewpoint the the reason Mary ends up in Bethlehem is because of a taxation and probably gossiping tongues can you imagine what it was like, Mary back in Nazareth, saying, um, yeah, I know there's a bump here, but me and Joseph, we didn't do anything. Sure you didn't, Mary. You can imagine all the, talk, no, this is the Spirit of God. Sure he did. So, so, so you can imagine getting Mary out of Nazareth would have been a good thing. She was with child and all that. Then Luke tells us this. He says this. He says, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. You need to pause here because it's really important words here. While they were there, not last minute, coming in, all of it, like in the late at night, final, no, no. While they were there, this was planned out, they were there. They were actually in somebody's house. Mary would have had plenty of women around to help her deliver the baby because this is the first century culture. This is just the way it was. And I had a lot of people last night were like, man, I never saw while they were there. Man, I know. But that's what happens. We sort of get these stories in our mind and we just sort of run through these stories without taking a moment to understand. While they were there, they were there. They arrived. Joseph knew what he was doing. He made sure they were there. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. They were there. They were situated. We'll see here. They were even in a house, and we'll just have to to work through the story a little bit. It says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no place for them in the inn. Ah, I knew it, Chip. See, there it is. Uh, there it is, right there, Holiday Inn. I knew the story was right. I knew, this was, I knew that, uh, that, that, that apostrophe needed to be here. I know it's not. Well, hold on. Hold on. First of all, 
most of the newer translations are starting to understand and get this right. The, the correct translation is the guest room. That's the best, that's the translation. The Greek word means guest room. Um, remember, Luke wrote Luke. He also wrote um, the story of the Good Samaritan. He does not use the same word for where the Good Samaritan stayed, which would have been an inn, like he uses here. Um, and part of it is that we don't understand first century housing, so therefore we wouldn't understand what he's actually saying. When he says there's no room for them in the inn, what he's saying is this, there's no room for them in the guest room. This is a first century Palestine house. Up top, okay, is where people would stay and sleep. It was, it was the upper room, it was, it was the guest room, it was the upper part of the house. In the lower part of the house was where the kitchen was and storage and where they kept the animals. And the reason they kept the animals inside is because those animals were important. If you left them outside, somebody stole them, you were, you were done. That was how a lot of your food came from and stuff like that. So you really protected those animals. Um, tradition is that the house that Jesus would have been in, that, that it was attached to a cave. And, and that the animals were kept back in a cave-like area. Um, but, but, but the reality is we know this about the house. And here's what we know. You know who slept up top? It's the culture. It was the older people. Didn't make a difference if you were pregnant or not. Bottom line was is if, is, if, is if there was enough older people to be sleeping in the upper part of the house in the guest room, it meant that you would be sleeping in the lower part of the house. And that's why there was no room for them in the guest room. They were in a house, they just weren't in the upper parts because there probably were family people that were in for the registration and, and they chose the house that they, and they might have could have gone to another house where they could have had a sleeping quarters but the bottom line, they chose to be in a place, they got there, while they were there, Mary decided to have, it was time for her to give birth and there was no place for them to sleep in the upper part of the house in the guest room, they were down in the lower part with the animals which is why we have a manger. So again, not trying to disrupt your nativity scenes. Um, you can keep them out. I'm not coming by your house and seeing who has them up and who doesn't have them up. Um, I'm just saying, that, that let's, let's go to Scripture and see what Scripture is saying because Scripture is what we should be understanding. And this story then becomes much more deeper and much more profound because Jesus is still born in incredibly lowly, a lowly place. He's still placed in a dirty manger. None of those things are taken away, but there is a lot more depth to the story if we take a moment and pause. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some take-homes to chew on, to think about, and then over the next couple of weeks we're going to really delve into this manger thing and, and talk about what that means for you and me and why Jesus was placed in that manger and what that sign um, really was telling the, the shepherds and ultimately telling you and me. But just in the story that we've told, there's some things I think we need to hear, especially in the world that we live in today. The first one is this, Inherent in the story is the sovereignty of God that stands above the political situation of the day. And, and I think we need to hear this because, because we, we, we tend to, much like the Jewish people of the day, get bogged down in all of the things that are going on. R rather than the story is clearly telling you and me that God is using all of the affairs of the world to do what he is going to accomplish. In fact, I, Howard Marshall, he, great New Testament scholar, he's, he's deceased, but he says this about the passage. He says, the fiats of earthly rulers can be utilized in the will of God to bring his more important purposes to fruition. Like, do we believe that God is sovereign? And see, what I would tell you is this, is that God's kingdom is always greater than worldly politics. It's always greater. That's what the story's telling you. If you I mean, yes, it's, it, we, we tell the story and we do the lights and we do all the things that we do, but like, what is the story really telling you and me? What's telling you and me that what looks like is going on in a world that's ugly and, and, and oppressive and fighting and sedition and, and groups and factions and killings, and murderings of babies, and all of these things, that God stands above it. And he can get his child to where he needs it to be, Mary's child to where he needs it to be, his son to Bethlehem, because he's God, and he stands above it all. That is a word 
we need to hear. Not only that, but God's kingdom is always disruptive to worldly politics. It's disrupting everything. I mean, Caesar thinks he's the the leader. Caesar thinks he is the man. And everybody knows about Caesar because he's got a decree. But the real ruler of the world is over in a small little town. And the people that are invited to come see him are the lowly shepherds. The ones that wouldn't be allowed in the temple because they're ritually unclean handling animals. The ones that would never be allowed in the church of the day. The ones that are far from God. Thank God he came to the shepherds because that means he can come to me and that means he can come to you. And you would think that the presence of the Lord would be in Jerusalem, in the temple. But oh no, the angels come into a pasture to a bunch of dirty shepherds to say, let me tell you about the king. That's good, good, good news to you and me. But see, it's disruptive. This is going to disrupt everything. It's going to disrupt Herod. It's going to disrupt Pilate, everything. That's why I always say, if you got Jesus really fit and snugly and securely in your politics, can I tell you something? That ain't Jesus. That's not Jesus. He does not fit in worldly systems. As much as you may want to put him in there, I can tell you, you got the accent mark in the wrong place. His kingdom is of another world. His kingdom doesn't work like this world. His kingdom doesn't look like this world. In fact, his kingdom is going to squash every kingdom in this world because he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He already is, and one day everybody will notice that. So inherent in the story is the sovereignty of God, and we should take heed to that, especially in the world that we live in today. That's crazy. It's crazy today. That's the the Greek word, crazy. Anyway, so... Secondly, in the story here, the powerful are being brought down and the lowly are being lifted up. When Mary is uh, at Elizabeth's house, she has a a moment, we call it the Magnificent, and and she says something that is is being sort of um, cascaded out through, through Luke. She says, he's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And so in the passage you have a contrast of a world ruler and a world redeemer. And they could not be more antithetical. Couldn't be more of a difference. See, the the world ruler lives in luxury because he can tax people. But the world redeemer is lowly and he comes in a dirty, nasty feeding trough. See, the story about Christmas, Jesus came into the mess and the muck and the dirt of the world because he came to save. He came to redeem. And there's a contrast here of Augustus and Jesus, the world ruler has a decree that goes worldwide. But the world redeemer has some good news that goes to the shepherds, the ones most marginalized from God, the ones that the religious people would say, they're terrible, they're no good, don't let them in. Man, some things change, but some things stay the same. The ones God's after, the one a lot of times the religious people are looking to push outside of the church. Thank God. Because we may think we're righteous. We may think that we have it together. I can assure you, the only thing that's good about what's going on in me and the only thing that's good about going on in you, if you are believers, is the flow of Calvary and the blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus that makes you and me what we are. In and of myself, I know where I'm at. Please, as a church, let's make sure that we always remember that Jesus' heart is for the shepherds, those the furthest away from the church house. Let's make sure that we want to go reach those people by being intentional neighbors that reflect Christ. Amen? Amen? The world ruler is going to bring peace 
through might. I'm going to bring it through bloodshed of others. We'll keep you safe by using force. But the world redeemer brings true peace through his blood. He sheds his blood. Here's the reality of the gospel message. The gospel message comforts the afflicted, but it challenges the comfortable. And we probably need to hear that word because if Jesus isn't making, if, if they're in a little sandpaper in your britches every once in a while with Jesus, you probably aren't really engaging the true Jesus. I don't know if that's the right way to say it in church, but I'm from Kentucky. So uh, um, just, yeah. that's just how the cow eats the cabbage. So, um, and the third thing is that the manger reminds us that this isn't a sentimental feel-good story. We, 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 need to, we need to stop here and realize that Jesus comes in the middle of bloodshed, killing kids, oppression, taxation, suppression of people, um, exploitation of people. I mean, he comes in the middle of the muck and the mire and the dirt of life. See, the manger doesn't allow us to see Jesus lying as a baby to simply be gazed at and adored. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the one that you come to the manger in the dirt, in the ugliness, and you have to make a decision. Is he the Lord? Because if he's the Lord, you can't just gaze at and go, oh, he's so pretty, he's so nice. We do that, right? I mean, we got this story, you know, um, no crying he makes. Come on, you don't think Jesus cried? He cried. I mean, these, these, some of these songs we sing are crazy. I mean, nobody wants to say it. I will, you know. Um, I mean, th- 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 we, like, we're not thinking. We got all these traditions and all these things, but we're not really thinking. What is the story telling you and me? Telling us, you can't just smile and, and, and go, oh, look how cute the baby is. No, this baby is going to go and die on a cross. That's why he looks dead, but he is alive. He will rise from the dead with death and hell in his hands and eternal life to give to those who will come to the manger and bow. Because let me tell you something, wise men still seek him. Not only that, but the manger doesn't just allow us to see this beautiful, helpless, and speechless baby that just allows us sort of to create whatever we want to create about our religion at all. No, no, no calling us to something deeper it's calling us to something more profound isn't it crazy that the word of God that would communicate to us who the father was comes with the inability to speak when he's born the Latin in fons which is where we get infant from means inability to speak think about that how humble how lowly How gracious is our God? I mean, this is, this story is just, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You don't bring the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and putting him in a feeding trough. King of Kings and Lord of Lords in our minds are powerful. And, 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 And what does he do? He rises from the table in John 13 and he girds himself with a towel and he washes feet. I mean, this is, this is, people ask me all the time, you really believe the Bible's the word of man? You better believe it. Ain't no way in the world any human being would create such a crazy story. We would never write something like this because we want our gods and our stuff to be, you know, powerful and all this stuff. And for him to come with this lowliness and kindness and graciousness, it's humbling. It's a rich story. In fact, The manger reminds us that Jesus came in the lowliest of ways and the dirt of our life to the outcast and to thus enter our world to raise dead people to life. Let me ask you a question. Maybe at this Advent season, maybe this is a time to reflect a little bit on who Jesus is and what he's done and what he means. And and what I would like for you to do is to just take a moment and what area in your life does the accent mark need to get moved 
into the right position? Is it your marriage? Is it your health? Is it a relationship with a mom or a dad? Is it a closer walk with Jesus? Is it settling eternity once and for all? What is it? I think all of us can take a moment and go, you know, God, search me and know me. So many times we've got the accent mark here and I'm comfortable, but maybe it needs to be here. Maybe Christmas is really a story about a God who came to put things back to right, to redeem. What area of your life today, you online, can God redeem? Because the beautiful thing about him is he comes into the dirt and muck and stuff of our lives to show us that he cares about us. We take a minute and you online as well and just bow your heads and bow your hearts and just take a moment and think right now, God, what do I need to get put right in my, in my life? What are some areas that maybe today I could cry out to you and say, please work on this area of my life. And Lord, I know that you will because if you came and laid in a feeding trough, Lord, then I know that you can come and lay in the midst of the dirt of my life to redeem it. Maybe be a shepherd today. Maybe you feel outcast. Maybe you feel marginalized. Maybe the angels are singing over you saying, hey, I've got a sign for you. Come to the manger. Come and see the baby that looks dead but yet's alive. Because guess what? He can take areas that are dead in your life and he can make them raise again. Just ask the Lord to take a moment and to speak to you and to work on some of the areas in your life. Because what I can tell you is he did it then. He can do it again today. He can speak to you and me and he can change lives forever. The same God that did it then can do it now and he can do it again for you right now in this moment.